The Projects, The PJs, Section 8, Government Housing, Public Housing, Low-Cost High-Rise Units. All these terms represent public housing projects, a government-subsidized housing development with relatively low rents most commonly found in America's largest cities. The projects are a mid 20th century development and are well known for being uninspiring looking large brick buildings. Most of these public housing projects were built using federal money following World War II. Unfortunately, the projects quite quickly became a way to separate lower income minorities from wealthy white neighborhoods. But why has the government spent the last 30 years tearing down buildings of their own creation that were only built a few decades prior? Especially given that we are in the midst of an affordable housing crisis, wouldn't low-cost housing built on giant plots of lands in cities with strong economies be the no-brainer solution to the affordable housing crisis that we're facing today? And if the projects are being knocked down, what's being built in their place? Techwood Homes was the first federal public housing project in the United States and it was built in Atlanta, Georgia, a 604 unit whites only neighborhood created to address the US's infrastructure and housing needs at the time. Ironically, in order to develop this whites only neighborhood, local officials had to seize property of black residents through eminent domain. The federal government was not allowed to seize property this way, but there were no regulations on local and state governments using this tactic, allowing the US government to uh, look the other way. Eminent domain allows the government to take ownership of private land or property and convert it to public use the uh, government has to pay market value you can imagine that the seller of that land sometimes doesn't agree to the price that the government wants to pay in his book the color of law richard rothstein goes into more depth on the segregationist beginnings of public housing no i think that the guilt complex of the american white man is so profound until when you begin to analyze the real condition of the black man in america Instead of the American white man eliminating the causes that create that condition, he tries to cover it up by accusing his accusers of teaching hate. But actually, they're just exposing him for being responsible for what exists. <clears throat> well, that's, that's uh, something of, of an argument. The Housing Act of 1949 increased the number of public housing agencies in the U.S., but in 1954, it was ruled that the practice of separate but equal as it applied to education did not apply to housing. It was Dwight D. Eisenhower's administration that ended the policy that mandated black and white communities receive equal quality housing. In the late 50s, when they, uh, the uh, age of dependent children came about, and the only way you could get it if there was no father in the home. And it drove the men away. It drove the men out. I mean, if you don't have a job and you can't support your family, the only way they can get food is for you to be out of the home, then you have to leave. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. For the next 14 years, public housing remained a legal tool for segregation, all the way up until the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Just six years after the court ruled in favor of fair housing, President Richard Nixon, who is definitely not a crook, put a moratorium on federal housing spending. Listen, I don't want a president who's warm on the outside and warm on the inside, too. I want one that's warm on the outside, but I want one who, when the tough decisions are made, is cold and tough and will make the right decision without uh, fear of failure. So 1974 was the last year the federal government had funding to construct public housing. And with no funds, as well as austerity cuts under President Reagan in the 1980s, the quality of public housing declined rapidly. Lower taxes, less social spending, that's Reaganomics. In 1989, Congress created the National Commission on Severely Distressed Public Housing to see how the nation's public housing projects were holding up. When you leave your apartment and the outside of your apartment is worse than the inside of your apartment, how would you feel? It, it literally looks like New Jack City in some of these buildings. That's a safety issue. It's not even connected. The agency found that 6% of the buildings in the U.S. were in a severely distressed state. And so Congress appropriated $600 million to an urban renewal program called the HOPE 6 program. This program's funds were used to demolish distressed buildings and replace them with mixed income housing. It started with a bang and a round of applause. 
all over Chicago, they're tearing down the cinder block dinosaurs known here simply as the projects. They've been a disaster with generations of children raised in the squalor, but no more. By the end of 2009, all 53 of Chicago's public housing high-rises will be gone. The new mixed-income units that were built in their place were often too expensive for the majority of the original residents to live in, thus helping get us to the affordable housing crisis of the 21st century. The U.S. strategy has been to privatize the building of affordable housing projects through housing voucher programs and subsidies for developers who had a few low-income units in otherwise very expensive buildings. Rising land, construction, and operation costs have further reduced the feasibility of building new affordable housing projects when it compares to mixed-income units. The land that these distressed housing projects were occupying in places like New York City, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles was also highly valuable and could be sold at a very high price. But what do they mean when they say distressed housing projects? They're really talking about two things, the state of the building, which is their fault, and the crime, which is the fault of the residents. I'm coming down the sixth floor, west entrance. Okay, okay, come on down, come on down. All right. The projects are renowned for being a hotbed of criminal activity. The enclosed nature of these developments makes it extremely difficult for police to enter and exit without being put at a massive risk. Officer Davis, these people all out on the hoods of the cars and in the parking lot, those are gang leaders? Yes, they are. Uh, they, they have lookouts up in uh, the highest points of the building to see us when we come. Because of this design, it is incredibly defensible territory for gangs, allowing drug and human trafficking, as well as violent criminal activity to flourish without much opposition. According to the National Institute of Justice, or NIJ, many studies support that drug and violent crime are severe problems in housing development. From 1986 to 1989, average annual rates of drug offenses in housing developments were 33 per 1,000 residents in Washington, D.C., 53 per 1,000 residents in Phoenix, and 50 58 per 1,000 residents in Los Angeles. The rates for violent offenses are even higher in those cities, with 41 per 1,000 in Washington, D.C., 54 per 1,000 in Phoenix, and 67 per 1,000 people in Los Angeles. Now, it's important to note that these numbers are averages, so a few high crime activity projects brought up the numbers for an entire city's projects. But people like Ronald Robinson believe the success stories will continue to be scarce here until the management of public housing is cleaned up. For people who don't understand public housing, have never lived in it in their lives, and don't know what the real circumstances are, it's very easy to blame the people themselves. But I know, for instance, that it's not the people's fault that the elevators don't run. Robinson sits on the board of commissioners of the Chicago Housing Authority. Labor unions are getting rich off of public housing. There's special labor laws just for public housing. Contractors nationwide are reaping huge profits. So politicians are receiving contributions from the contractors and the labor unions. An important note buried deep in a 120-page document linked below, breaking down the crime statistics used to create the HOPE 6 program, discusses using multivariate techniques for spatial analysis of crime. I felt that it was an important call out and necessary to be aware of whenever looking at any correlation between low-income public housing and crime in a fair way. The report states that one important question that this research does not address is whether public housing has crime rates that are higher than would be expected given other characteristics of public housing developments, like the age of the residents and the income. This study does not ask how the public nature of public housing contributes to offense rates. All crime happening in public housing is not by said residents. The report simply says that crime is higher in the projects than the surrounding neighborhoods, without researching whether the criminals were living primarily in the projects and not in those surrounding neighborhoods. By tearing down the projects, you may not be solving the problem, but just spreading it out. Which, if your goal is mainly to increase land value as opposed to address housing and crime issues, then mission accomplished. Charles Murray's book, Losing Ground, suggests that government welfare should be abolished. We put them in a little world of their own which they could survive in, but not prosper in. And so we have economic growth now, lots of people getting jobs, but not that set of people. 
Murray does not pay enough attention to the problems of joblessness created by the fundamental shifts in the American economy and how these problems have affected welfare uh, work patterns. From now on, we shall be seeing much demolition. The first step in making our cities better places to work, better places to live. So this all leads to contemporary gentrification. These mixed income developments typically include subsidized housing as well as market rate apartments and condos, encouraging integration between different income levels while also providing increased access to resources such as grocery stores and public parks for residents. There's not a whole lot we can do for the youngster who is now in his mid-twenties and has never held a job. And the ultimate solution is to maintain the housing projects until we reach a point in our society where we have jobs and job training that will enable people to become more uh, independent, self-reliant. Public housing neighborhoods were traditionally difficult to gentrify by design. Neighborhoods which boast apartment buildings that offer a mix of high and low income units allows the chance to gentrify a neighborhood while still allowing for some rent control units to exist. The difficult place we find ourselves today is that the segregation that traditional housing projects forced on our society was not ideal. Residents were often forgotten by their governments and hidden away from the rest of society. However, with the solution that we have now, there is a lack of affordable units for low income residents. These cities have spent decades replacing buildings that offer hundreds of low income units with buildings that offer no more than a few dozen at most. I will admit, I'm no Pythagoras, but the math ain't mathin'. Much respect, and I'll see y'all next time.